Every day, Britain flushes away over 100 million litres of urine. But what if I told you that hidden within your wee are hundreds of secrets that scientists are only now beginning to discover? I'm Dr Christian Jessen, and I believe our urine could be liquid gold when it comes to picking up problems with our health. GP Dr Amir Khan and I want to show how urine could act as an early warning system to many life-threatening diseases. We're at the cutting edge of science here. Those little pots of urine over there will act like lie detector tests. We'll be embarking on the biggest urine test the UK has ever seen. With unique stunts along the way... The ancient Romans can do it, I can do it. We'll be placing pea pods in four major cities. Hundreds of people will take a leak so that we can take a peek. And over the next 90 minutes, we'll reveal the results of each city's hidden secrets. The people with the most unique and worrying urine results will be brought to our Liverpool hub, where we'll reveal to them the startling truth about their health. This is Chasney's amounts. Quite spectacularly, <laughs> impressively huge. We'll uncover the chronic diseases they didn't know they had. You've got a real risk of something called type 2 diabetes. And even the things which could kill them. If I carry on this way, the blunt reality is I'm not going to be around as long as I want to. This is a national health checkup. I don't think Glasgow's going to do well at all. There's a lot of drinking around Bristol. I think the samples are probably going to be quite alcohol fueled. There's going to be Cornish pasties, hash, weed. No, 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 Liverpool's your order to be clean. It'll be clean, as clean as the Mersey. Welcome to the Great British Urine Test. With lifestyle-related chronic illnesses, such as type 2 diabetes, costing the NHS more than £11 billion a year, we all need to understand what our bodies are trying to tell us before we get ill. But could the very thing we flush away be the secret to keeping us healthy? In the last year, scientific breakthroughs in urine testing have shown that our we could be a key to early cancer detection and identifying hidden killer diseases. Our scientists at Aberystwyth University are using groundbreaking techniques to decode the secret messages that our bodies are trying to send us. Tonight, our state-of-the-art tests reveal with incredible accuracy everything from how much booze we've drunk to what we've eaten in the last week. Are baked beans a favourite of yours? I just eat a lot of them. Let's put it this way, I'm often spraying air freshener on him. <laughs> we'll use these results to help people cut out their bad habits and get Britain peeing better. Urine is our body's liquid waste. Mainly made of water, salts and chemicals produced by our kidneys as they break down food and drink and filter toxins from our blood. But we can all learn something every time we take a trip to the loo. We want to teach you how to read your urine just by how it looks and smells. To do this, Amir is taking a selection of urine samples to Carolot Nursery. Here, the staff are no strangers to pee, expertly changing around 25,000 nappies a year. But through sight and smell alone, do they know what to watch out for in our wee? Hi, Rosie. Nice, Hi, to, meet nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. <laughs> I'm looking Hi, forward to this. Owner Rosie has volunteered herself and colleagues Linda and Susan to see if they can sniff out the most worrying samples. What are we thinking with this one, then? It's a bit dark. Yeah. Whiskey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're heading from wine to whiskey now, yeah. are we? Yeah, fair enough. We would think about asking that person uh, to drink a bit more, yeah. wouldn't we? Let's have a look at our next one. Should we give it a smell? Oh, no, no come on, we, we have to, we have to. I'll get it out of you first. Oh, that's not nice. 
No. Oh, no. <laughs> You're already making the face. Come on, do no, it. No, it's not. That's not pleasant at all. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think, um, yeah. I think, I think we that... should get that patient to the hospital. I think we right? should, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Looking at that, uh -huh. you can see the spectrum of, of, of hydration, really. You know, yes. these two, we know they've been drinking fine. They shouldn't be suffering from headaches, fatigue, dizziness, that kind of thing. But when you're coming into this area here, particularly these two, you, you do start you to feel. You would expect to feel ill. Yeah. And the first thing might just be a headache and your initial feeling is to go and get some paracetamol yeah. and that kind yeah. of thing. You don't often think, oh, maybe I, I just need to drink water. more. Yeah. It is really that simple, but I think that, that really goes to show. Urine with a strong scent and dark colour can be a sign of dehydration. If left unchecked, it can lead to more serious health problems like kidney stones, infections, and in extreme cases, kidney failure or even death. And it's not the only thing our urine can warn us about. What do we think oh, about wow. <laughs> this? Medicine or...? Medicine, yeah. So certain medication can turn your pee green. Okay. Uh, things like amitriptyline, which sometimes people take for pain, mm -hmm. uh, indomethacin, which people take for gout, something called propofol, which is an anaesthetic. So just be prepared if your doctor gives you medication and your pee it turns out colour. Yeah. Okay. Don't ban it. <laughs> Never more, seen that more that way. Commonly, uh, <laughs> food dyes can do it as well. OK, what do you reckon about this one? No, is it vitamin tablets or something? Mm. Like the Roca? You're or... very clever. Yeah. But it can be a sign of something serious mm -hmm. as well. Blood in your urine can, can change it this colour. You know, if you do think you've got blood in your urine, you must go and see a GP, because it can be something simple like kidney stones or an infection, okay. but it can be the sign of something more sinister okay. uh, like a cancer. So it is important that, that to check. have it checked out if you do get kind of pinkish or reddish urine. Okay. Right, let's put that to one side. Let's have a look at our last sample. Oh, look at this. Oh, oh can you see yes, that? Definitely. It's got a bit of fizz in there. What do we make of that? Is it protein? Absolutely right, protein. Protein in your urine will make it froth up like that. It can be a sign of kidney problems, it can be a sign of infection, but even heart problems as well. If you've got frothy urine, go and see your doctor. It's recommended that six to eight glasses of water will help keep you hydrated. You might be surprised to know a glass of milk can be more hydrating than water, or go for foods like melon, celery and bananas to help keep your pee clear. Our pee pods have been set up in Cardiff. Would you provide some of your wee for science? Oh, Bristol. You want to take part, guys? Pee for Bristol. Glasgow. Are you happy to provide a urine sample for it? And Liverpool. Don't let anyone in because I will have your little thing here. At our pee pods, it's one in, one out. Analyzing our urine can tell us all sorts of things, even what we've been up to at the weekend. It's going to be quite surprising what you're going to find in here because I've just been on a lad's holiday for the weekend, so um, I hope my nan doesn't see this. <laughs> Bristol when it comes to drugs. You hear all kinds of stuff about how we dig cocaine. <laughs> More than a million Brits admitted to using a Class A drug in the last year. But we want to know from our tests which city does more. First up, cocaine. From the samples we tested... Liverpool. Ten times the number of users than Bristol. Now, opiates. This time, it was Bristol who scored the highest. And finally, according to our sample, the city with the most ecstasy users... It's Liverpool again. We'll reveal Class B drug results later in the programme. Coming up... We'll find out how a beaker of urine and a very clever dog could spot whether you have cancer. Oh, and she's found it. Oh so my that goodness means me. there's prostate cancer volatiles in that, that sample. That is extraordinary. And we hunt out the nation's diet secrets to reveal exactly what we've been eating. Still not convinced your urine's trying to tell you something? Well, I've discovered another scientific advancement that might just change your mind. 
At this training facility in Milton Keynes, they're developing an early form of cancer screening that takes just moments, requires only a small sample of urine, and one very special detector. I'm meeting CEO and founder, Dr. Claire Guest. She's been training dogs to sniff out disease for the last 17 years. What started all this off? The work started with cancer detection. Mm. Now, many years ago, there were anecdotes that dogs seemed to be warning their owners about cancer. And a friend of mine had uh, a mole on her leg. She was a young girl, she was in her 20s, didn't seem to be anything unusual. Mm. But her pet dog kept on licking and sniffing at this mole. Mm. She went to a GP, she had the mole removed, the GP wasn't concerned. But it came back as malignant melanoma. I have to tell you how serious that is no. in a young girl. No. Going out and telling this story did actually give me a greater passion and enthusiasm. How many millions of people around the world could the science behind this help in the future? So these two boys who are being very well behaved. Indeed. Are, are they part of the programme and how would they... They are indeed. These are biodetection dogs. These are dogs that work detecting disease in samples. Right. So they're trained to find the odour of the disease in samples and often we use urine. He is a biosensor with a fluffy coat, big brown eyes and a waggy tail. Dogs are widely used to sniff out drugs, explosives and firearms. And now, if trained correctly, their incredible sense of smell could detect chemicals produced in urine when a tumour is present. So, welcome to our biodetection area where the dogs are trained. So what we've got is a small urine sample. This is from a patient who sadly has had a diagnosis of prostate cancer. Yeah. And these are from patients who are cancer clear. We're going to place the samples out. Out of a total of eight urine samples, only one has come from a cancer sufferer. It will now be up to the dog to correctly identify the sample. Oh yeah, here's Florin. Now what Bob's going to do is going to set her off and ask her to sniff the samples in turn. So the handler doesn't know, so can't influence it in any way. Oh so my that goodness means me. there's prostate cancer volatiles in that, that sample. That is extraordinary. Yeah. I, I'm gobsmacked. <laughs> I mean, hey, I knew they were clever, but that was far yeah. quicker than I ever... I mean, that was no effort at all. What other things are you teaching the dogs to do to be able to detect in urine? Well, we have dogs that very reliably can detect uh, bladder cancer and kidney cancer from a urine sample. So we've actually got a quantum physicist coming from America in the next couple of weeks. Dogs are the only creature on the planet currently that know what cancer smells like. But he wants to learn and inform artificial intelligence so that one day we may all have, even perhaps on our phones, a device that can tell us whether or not we smell of cancer volatiles. I love the fact that dogs are teaching quantum physicists. Isn't that a nice Absolutely. turnaround? Absolutely, it really is. In our lab, our scientists have also been sniffing out secrets from people's urine. Their tests measure chemical markers in urine created when our bodies process foods, drugs, alcohol and even air pollution. We've invited members of the public with the most worrying results to receive a detailed consultation at our Liverpool hub. Our aim is to stop bad habits from turning into life-threatening illnesses. Well, we're at the cutting edge of science here. These small samples of urine can tell us huge amounts about people's health. And what's really important is that they detect it early on, uh, before they have time to manifest as chronic diseases. Those little pots of urine over there will act like lie detector tests. Now, Christian, take a look at this. This one really sticks out for me. There's something not quite adding up. That's a very imbalanced diet, isn't it? Yes. But it's a terrible diet by the look of it. And this thing's completely missing, and then things sky high. I feel a new patient has just arrived. Let's get her in. This person's diet is so deficient in protein and key nutrients that they are at risk of being malnourished. Can I please have... 
Michelle. Come with me. 40-year-old Michelle from Fife has brought husband Gary along for moral support. For the last 20 years, it's been, right, I must do something with my weight. I must do something, I must do something. And every day I'm saying, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. It'll be fine, tomorrow. Well, now it's tomorrow. Hi, Michelle. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Hello, I'm Amir. Nice Hi, I'm Gary. We've got a few questions for you. OK. Let's take a look, shall we? We're looking at this general meeting table. Where do you think you are? Oh, I'm absolutely there. That is you. That is me. Yes. yes. I take it you don't eat meat? No. No. So that's not a surprise. So then we've had a look at legumes, which being a vegetarian, presumably you have lots of. Yes. So this is a low intake of legume, as it would show in a urine sample. What are legumes, by the way? Do you know? No. Beans, peas, chickpeas, pulses, that kind of thing. OK. Let's have a look at what high looks like. So where do you come on the legume intake scale? Let's have a look. <gasps> no! Wow! Does that you? Yes! Why? Do um, you eat legumes? Well, I thought I did, but clearly I, I don't. The reason why we're interested in this particularly yes. because you aren't eating meat, which is a good source of protein, so you That's need right. to get it from somewhere else. Yes. And legumes <gasps> are a good source of protein for vegetarians, but you're not getting it from no. there. No. For vegetarians, not eating legumes means missing out on a great source of proteins, zinc and iron. It's quite bad. It's really bad. What is this doing to me? Vegetarian Michelle's urine also scores low on soya and leafy greens. So, what about chocolate? Yeah, we can even know your chocolate from your wee. Did oh, you know that we no, could do that? No, no. Oh, that no! That is quite a spectacular intake. I like how you're really surprised, and Gary is not surprised whatsoever. <gasps> I was expecting it to be high, because I know diet's not, not great, to be honest. Yeah. Gary, seeing this, are you worried about Michelle? I'd like to think we'd have a, a long and healthy life together, so, yes, yeah, so these results do worry me a lot. Hmm. I can't believe how much in denial I've been about what I eat. I'm stunned, even though I shouldn't be. <laughs> I'm a little bit embarrassed. In fact, I'm massively embarrassed and, and ashamed, actually. Dr Amir has also checked Michelle's BMI, which is sitting at 42. In clinical terms, she's morbidly obese. What it means is that your weight has got to a point where it will be having an adverse effect on your health. <sighs> My concern with you, Michelle, is that your BMI is high, you're getting a lot of your food through carbohydrates, uh, and you're carrying a lot of your weight around the midsection. All of that is a bit of a melting pot for type 2 diabetes, and I think it's really important, as well as testing for some of your vitamins and iron levels, that we do a test for type 2 diabetes and see where we are okay. with that. Michelle's urine has raised some real questions about her health, and we want her to make some serious changes. I'm never, ever going to tell you not to be vegetarian, but remember that being vegetarian isn't always the healthiest option if you're not getting it right. It's been a really hard day. I feel broken. But when you're broken, you've got to build yourself back up, and I can build myself up to be a better person. Better version of me, so are we doing this? Nice. We're doing this. Michelle will return to the hub in five weeks to find out if her health has improved and if she can provide a sample with no hidden nasties. At our pea pods across the UK, we're testing for everything from diet to drink and drugs. I think it's going to be pretty clean. I've had quite a healthy week. You know, trying to get my nutrients in. Haven't been on the booze yet. Come back on Friday, maybe. Might be different. <laughs> Cardiff in general has got like quite a big nightlife, lots of students, so I reckon there'll be a lot of alcohol picked up in the samples. A recent report stated that Brits are among the highest drinkers in the world. So, which of our four test cities claim the unenviable title of being the biggest boozers? Right, let's pee. And the city which drank the most alcohol, according to our results, is... 
It's Cardiff, with well over 20 times more than Glasgow, which is our least boozy city. Back at our Liverpool hub, the markers for alcohol in one particular sample has caught our eye. You know, it's not for me to judge people's alcohol intake, is it? <laughs> but there's quite a lot of alcohol going on in some of these, aren't there? There is a lot of alcohol going quite on, impressive. surprisingly. I mean, this one, I think, possibly might benefit from some of your wise words. I'll do what my do best. Excessive alcohol consumption can have serious long-term consequences. It's been linked to high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, and an increased risk of cancer. Excuse me. I would like to see... This particularly high result belongs to 19-year-old Shazney. Shazney, please. Hello. Yeah. A digital marketing assistant from Norfolk, we're keen to find out why her readings are so high. I do like to go out for a drink every now and then, play a bit of pool down the local pub. Me and my partner literally love doing that. Get the friends round. We spend a lot of time with our friends. Shazney, come on in. This is Dr Amir. Hi, Hi, Shazney. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Thank you. And really, this is all about this. Yeah. little golden sample here. This is a urine sample that you gave us today. Yeah. There's one main thing that we noticed in your urine. And the clue is on those words there, which <laughs> is your alcohol intake. Yeah. So let's have a little look. Down here is an average amount of alcohol that we might see in an average drinker being excreted in urine. OK. This is Chasney's amount. So that's quite spectacularly, <laughs> impressively huge. <laughs> and nothing to be proud of, let me tell you that. Yeah, no, no, that's... Why is it like that? I don't know. Yes, you do. <laughs> I mean, I like a drink every now and then. OK. How often are you boozing to these sorts of amounts, which I'm guessing is um, more than a couple of drinks? Most nights I'll have a drink, but it's normally when it hits the weekend is where we go a bit crazy. My local pub sells gin, and it's like three pounds of gin. So I'm, like, on the gins, and gin gets me very drunk, and I don't realise it until I'm, like, four gins down and I'm, like, stumbling. With Shazney often drinking up to seven gins on a weeknight and more at the weekend, she's way over the recommended guidelines. It used to be different for men and women, but now it's exactly the same. They should be drinking no more than 14 units of alcohol a week. And more than that, we should be all having two to three alcohol-free days a week. Is it starting to affect things in your life, like your work or your home life? Um, I feel like it may be taking a sort of a toll on my immune system because I'm always ill and my work has even pointed out to me that I'm, like, always ill and need to do something about it. Directly. Genuine illnesses? No, ge I was genuinely ill for a bit and okay. that's why I missed work, but then they spoke to me about my immune system and... Mm. Did that make you change anything or not? Um, I took some vitamins. <laughs> that <laughs> was didn't it. change anything else? <laughs> didn't alcohol, change the alcohol, no. Well, we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay. Right. Let's have a little, a little bit more, shall we? Shazni's urine also reveals secrets about another guilty pleasure. So we also had a look at how many potatoes were being excreted in your urine, okay. essentially. This is a high amount of potato okay. in urine. Okay. This is what you are. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is actually yeah. ridiculous. You mentioned that you go out with your friends at weekends and yeah. you drink a lot. Often what can happen after that yeah. is that you go into a chippy or a kebab yeah. shop and then this I just happens. eat loads of chips. Yeah. Is that what happens? Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty much it. I think it's important to say there's nothing necessarily wrong with these yeah. potatoes, don't yeah, you? It's of whether they're sort of substituting for other things that might be yeah. better. Uh, yeah. Are they? Possibly, yes. And Dr Amir suspects Shazni's boozing could be impacting her health in other ways, too. Alcohol can affect your sleep. Tell me about your sleep. Um, I don't really get a lot of it. Um, my body clock normally wakes me up about sort of 5.30, 5, 5 mm. o'clock every day, and if I sleep past that, I normally get a headache. Really? So I have to wake up early. Um, but I, I, know, I know that, but I still go to bed super late. How late is super late? Normally about... 2, 3 a.m. some nights. Some nights it's like midnight. We know that sleep is linked quite significantly to immunity and mm -hmm. immune system. So if you're not getting enough sleep, your immune system's taking a battering every single night. Yeah. It's just not recovering. That's what that rest period is for. That's what that sleep is yeah. for. Makes sense. Yeah. We want to make sure that the next time we see Shazni, her urine shows that she's been drinking a lot less. I think if you can be absolutely rigid yourself, if you have, OK, if I'm drinking one night, mm -hmm. I'm not going to drink the next night. You can yeah. have one night on, one night off. That's to start with. Yeah. 
Also, we need to look at your sleep patterns. Yeah. You're not getting nearly enough sleep. You know, you, you need to spend a minimum of six hours in bed. And the final thing, pretty much, is, is if you eat properly before you go out, which yeah. you probably don't do either, Eating do you? Eating cheating. <laughs> no, it's not, you see, that's the thing. It's really not. Because if you don't make these changes now, you will not be able to keep this up yeah. for long. Yeah. How do you feel about all that? I feel kind of determined, scared. Um, you know, because obviously it's a big change and making lifestyle changes is a big thing. But I kind of feel like, OK, it's now or never. Best of luck with all. Thank you. Shazni will have five weeks to adjust her lifestyle before returning to find out if her results have improved. Coming up... Dr. Amir braves an ancient bathroom ritual to find out if urine really works as a mouthwash. I'm going to do it. The ancient Romans can do it. I can do it. And one man discovers a shocking secret lurking in his sample. It's associated with developing Alzheimer's dementia too. Well, Welcome back to the Great British Urine Test. At our four pea pods, we're delving into the dark secrets of what we really put into our bodies. Oh, you'll probably find a McDonald's that I've just eaten. Chocolate, um, pizza, cottage pie, chips, peas and gravy, plus a nice creamy dessert. So what will we discover about our four cities' guilty food pleasures? There's no hiding from our results. When it comes to baked goods like pies, bread and cakes, Cardiff and Liverpool come out on top. As for sugary snacks, Liverpool, once a major import city for sugar, really does take the biscuit. Now, urine isn't just the golden ticket when it comes to diagnosis. It has many other weird and wonderful applications too. Throughout history, our ancestors have used urine in many unusual ways, from dyeing clothes to making gunpowder. The ancient Romans even used it as a mouthwash. Ugh. So today, I'm going to test whether my urine can be used to clean my teeth. One possible scientific explanation for our ancestors' unusual use of urine may be ammonia. Today, it's a chemical used in many household cleaners. Our urine produces ammonia, but only when it reacts with air. So, unfortunately for Amir, stale urine should work better. Amir is using special disclosing tablets to reveal the plaque on his teeth. So what you can see is that my teeth have gone red. Uh, now, this is new plaque, probably from lunch that I've had. Time to put the urine to the test. Right, here we go. This is my own urine. OK. <laughs> it really smells of urine. OK, I'm going to do it. The ancient Romans can do it, I can do it. Oh, no. Hang on. Oh, hang on, hang on, I can... Hang on. Oh, oh, oh God! Oh, let's have a look. <laughs> hang on. Do they look whiter? I think they might do. I think some of the redness has gone. Uh, but not enough for me to be converted from regular mouthwash to urine. <laughs> Since Shazni and Michelle's urine revealed their bad habits, they've been trying to improve their health and their pee before they return to our hub in three weeks to provide a final sample. But at home, they're both finding it tough. Excuse me. So this one a bit drained, a bit bleh. Like, oh, sure. I think my body is going, what are you doing to me? Well, carbs and chocolate, sugar. Of course, you can have withdrawals from this kind of food. I've had a fair few gins and maybe a few Jager bombs, but it's all good. Um, 
I've got hiccups. So, late night, fair amount of alcohol and chips. Again, not good, but I am do doing it in moderation. I'm not doing it every night, um, which obviously sometimes used to be the case. So, yeah. Air pollution is one of the biggest health concerns of modern times, killing an estimated 1.7 million children a year worldwide, as well as the first suspected case in Britain. But urine could now be a secret weapon in the fight against this killer. Recently, Belgian scientists discovered that they could detect dangerous levels of carbon in our urine showing that air pollution could be infiltrating our cells and organs, including our brains. Right, Christian, take a look at this. This chap mm. is higher than anyone else we've tested so far. He's, he's off the scale, really. He is way above the others, isn't he? There's mounting evidence that this level of pollution will have adverse effects on his health, and I think we need to make sure he knows that. Let's have a chat with him. I'll go and get him. Alex, all right. Continued high exposure can lead to a number of health problems, including asthma, cardiovascular conditions, as well as dementia. Alex, Alex Braun. Come with me, this way. 44-year-old Alex from Essex has come to the hub today with his wife, Emma. I definitely worry about my health. I ain't got as much energy as I used to have. I'm not as flexible, I know I'm getting older, but I know myself that a fit guy my age, 44, would be a lot better health than what I'm in. It all comes down to lifestyle choices, doesn't it? Right, this is Dr Amir, Alex and Emma. Hi, Alex, Amir, yeah. nice to meet you. Hi, Emma, Hello. nice Hello. to meet Hello. you. And Alex, you can blame this little pot of goodness here um, yeah. for what you're about to receive. And there's really one thing that I want to talk to you about that jumped out at us from the test that we did on your year, and it's to do with your indications of pollution. Now, Alex, if you take a look at this, this line represents the pollution in your urine that we know, if it goes above, can have adverse effects on your health. Right. So let's see where you are. Wow. Do you have any idea why that is? Probably the job I do. What is the job? I'm a black cab driver in London. Ah, oh, oh, yeah. right. Now it's that would explain this. <clears throat> yeah, <Okay. laughs> just a little bit. When you're driving around, are you driving around in the busiest times of the day? No, I'm, I'm a night driver, so I probably get in town for about four in the afternoon and then go through to like one in the morning. The pollution really shocked me. The times I drive, I don't, I don't feel like I, I get that much pollution. It's, uh, it's, it's eye-opening, yeah. Do you know anything about the adverse effects that Pollution not really, not you. really. I don't think about it because I've got to do it. It, it makes no... I'm not going to go around with a mask over my head because yeah. people go, what are you doing? And <laughs> that's the difficult it. thing. We've got to bear in mind that this is your livelihood. <clears> yeah. We have to give you workable solutions yeah. to it. What we do know about air pollution is that it can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease mm. uh, and also chronic lung problems as well, like asthma, even emphysema. Mm. And there's increasing evidence that it's associated with developing Alzheimer's dementia too. Right, okay. So your exposure to pollution needs looking into a bit mm. more. I feel like of a, of a morning now, I'm sort of bowling to get out of bed instead of springing up, you know? Like, I'm a bit tired in the... I'm always going to sleep, aren't I? And have you noticed that he's sort of getting a bit slower, less Definitely. vigorous than he Definitely. was? Definitely. The minute he sits on the sofa, his head's back and his eyes are closed. Yeah, but that's because you're normally moaning, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> In order to help get Alex's health back on track, we need to get on top of when and where he's taking in the most air pollution. The pollution issue, I think we need to look into a bit more. Well, I think you're absolutely right. It needs investigating. So we're going to give you a monitor to take away and look at the times at which the pollution levels are at their highest. Yeah. And then we can come up with a plan. Simple things like leaving gaps between cars when you're waiting in traffic, closing air vents, closing windows, that kind of thing might be enough to reduce that. But it needs looking into a bit more. We need a bit more information. I'll get loads of stick from my mates for, for, for wearing it, but at the end of the day, if no one does it, then no one finds out about the pollution. So mm. it'll be an eye opener for them in the long run. For me, the motivation is not just for myself, but for Emma, because I want to be around as long as I can for Emma and obviously my girls, you know, and I want to be able to 
when they have kids, they want to be able to enjoy their kids, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's going to be a massive motivation for me. All right, Alex, Thank you very much for your time. You. I really yeah, appreciate it. We'll be seeing Alex again in five weeks' time to see if he can reduce his pollution exposure and provide a cleaner sample. Coming up, Dr. Amir continues to put his body to the test in the name of science, this time facing a swarm of angry mosquitoes with only his urine to protect him. Oh, I can feel that I'm being bit. I'm being bit. Back at the hub, we're continuing to delve into the secrets contained within people's urine. I mean, they're all fairly low on fruit and veg, which is kind of what I'd expect, actually. Yes. It's the common picture, isn't it? I think everybody thinks they're getting enough fruit and veg, but often they find they're not. I mean, one chap for me sticks out over and above all the others, because he's not just low in fruit and veg, he's no fruit and veg, pretty consistently, isn't he? Absolutely, and that's very worrying. I think we should get him down here, don't you? Agree. Let's go, Jamie. I'll get him. Not eating fruit and veg can increase the risk of cancer and stroke. Poor diets have also been linked to premature aging and are believed to be responsible for more deaths than smoking. Jimmy Murphy? Please. Come on. 25-year-old Jimmy from Poole runs a mobile planetarium, teaching children about the wonders of the cosmos. I like to think I'm a cheeky chappy. Uh, I like making people laugh. That's the best thing I can do is make people laugh. I incorporate that into my shows at work. I do it with my friends when we go out. This is my colleague. Hi, Jimmy. Hi. Nice to see Hi, you. Good. You're right. <laughs> so I think the first thing we want to ask you, Jimmy, is why did you want to come and chat with us today? Uh, so I just want to improve my uh, general lifestyle. I'm due to become a father very soon. How soon? Uh, within the next two weeks. OK. Mm -hmm. Now that I've got a real reason for change. I'm very ready to become a father. Just can't wait to hold him and, and just do everything that I possibly can for him. If we look through your results, if we take green veg intake as a starting point, let's see where you sit. <laughs> it's lower than low, Jimmy, so, so we really need to have a think about yeah. this. My fruit and veg intake is zero. Veg. Why is that? I don't really know. It's not as if, you know, when I was younger, um, my, I used to eat carrots because my mum told me that they were orange chicken. Right. And then, uh, sin, soon that she sold it to you. Yeah, orange no. chicken. Sold and it then, to you. as soon as she told me that they were carrots, it's like something switched in my brain. Does it worry? It does worry me, yes. It's recommended that everyone gets at least five a day. It is really confusing knowing how much fruit and veg to eat. Sometimes things will say five portions, other things will say ten portions. Really, just as much as you can. There is no upper limit. As much as you can will really have a beneficial effect on your health. Jimmy's sample also reveals another hidden danger. Let's have a look at an average sort of sugar intake, all right, for the population. Let's have a look at what yours is to give you some context. You know, when I'm really thirsty, I won't think about going to get a drink of water. Mm. It will definitely be, you know, I need to have something fizzy. Yeah, and that, that is a sign of addiction. You know, mm. We know sugar is very addictive. If yeah. you're craving sugar, it certainly reflects on here. You know, I knew that I wasn't getting enough of the things that I need to, but the scale of just how bad it was um, was, was pretty upsetting. To get to the bottom of Jimmy's food aversions, I've taken him aside for a chat. If you eat vegetables now, what happens? You know, if I really psyched myself up and forced myself to try it, even then I would just think to myself, you don't like this, why are you eating this? What do you think is going to get you to overcome this? I need to reiterate the fact that I want to do this for my health and for becoming a father for the first time. You know, I'd feel almost bad for saying, well, you need to eat that, even though Daddy doesn't eat that. Yeah. If I carry on this way, the blunt reality is I'm not going to be around as long as I want to. And that's really tough for me to, you know, to come to grips with. To help Jimmy get on track with his diet and to improve his health in general, Amir and I have a programme we want him to follow. Jimmy, I think the first thing that we need to tackle, really, for you is your aversion to fruit and veg. I think it's not unreasonable to put you in front of a food psychologist, someone who's going to explore these issues and teach you techniques whereby you can overcome these, these, these phobias and these fears that you have and yeah. get you changing your habits, changing your ways and eating 
in a way that I think you want to eat. And I think there's only one other thing I want to tell you. You need to stop drinking like a 12-year-old boy. Yes. All right? You know, you drink a lot of fizzy pop. You know that's not ideal. No. Ways that you could go about doing it is do little <coughs> bargains with yourself. So, OK, I'm allowed a glass of fizzy pop yeah. as long as I've had a glass of water. Does that feel all right? Not overloading yeah. with information? No, I'm, I'm really excited to move forward and try and make positive changes. It's hugely important for me to make these changes now that the baby's on the way. I want to be able to do all these incredible things with him. Um, and it's scary to think that I won't be able to do those things if I carry on the way that I am. In just over a month's time, we'll show Jimmy his new results. But can he overcome old fears and put his health and his future first? The internet is full of myths and ideas about uses for urine. Some people even claim it's a mosquito repellent. To put this to the test, Amir's off to the University of Greenwich. So the theory is it's actually the presence of vitamin B1 or thiamine in the urine that repels the mosquitoes. And that's found in food such as uh, fortified cereals, tuna, legumes and, and peas, if we actually put that on our skin, uh, that might well repel the mosquitoes. Now, I'm a little bit nervous because I'm one of these people that if you put me in a room with a hundred other people, the mosquitoes will find me and just eat me alive. I just get devoured when I come up with these huge hives, but it's all in the name of science. Assisting Amir on his quest is Professor of Behavioural Entomology and lifelong lover of mozzies, Richard Hopkins. Hi, Richard. Hello. Wow, Good it's hot in you. here. Yeah. Yes, it is. It has to be, because the mosquitoes in here, they're all tropical species. Now, you know that I'm interested to learn whether urine can be used as a mosquito repellent. Talk me through what we're going to do. Well, the, the easiest way to do a very quick look at this is to give the mosquitoes a choice. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you some sterile gloves that you can have on, and then we can put some urine on one of the gloves and the other one not. Amir will then place both arms into the cage, a space he'll be sharing with more than 100 bloodthirsty mosquitoes. So which other mosquitoes that are potentially going to be feasting on me today? We've got a mixture of males and females, and the females will feed on you because they want your blood. The males don't feed on humans. Well, they don't feed on, on any animals. They don't blood feed. The thought of putting my hand in anything like this is, is actually really worrying for me. OK. <laughs> But before Amir faces his nemeses, we need a sample. Amir summons one up whilst the professor prepares his precious mosquitoes for battle. Well, some of them are trying to feed on me through the net already, so looks like they're all going to be nice and keen. Professor Hopkins liberally applies urine to the glove on Amir's right hand. It's quite strong stuff. <laughs> it is. I can smell it. Yeah. If urine is effective, this will be enough to repel them. If it isn't, the mozzies are likely to bite in a matter of seconds. They're ready for you. Okay. You yeah. sound slightly gleeful, Richard. Well, maybe I have a nasty side. <laughs> I'm starting to think you yeah. have. OK, I can already see one on my glove, and it hasn't, I haven't even got my hand in there yet. Both hands are in now, just the glove bits. I'm going to put my wrists in. OK, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Oh, they're, they're landing on me already. They're, they're yeah. landing on me. In fact, it looks like they're landing more on the urine arm than the non-urine arm. Oh, I can feel them, I can feel them! Oh, it's awful. They are actually congregating on the urine arm. I just wonder, oh, I can feel that a big bit, a big bit, a big bit! I think we can safely say that urine does not work as a mosquito repellent. So I'm going to end the experiment with that conclusion, I think. Right. OK. 
So I don't know if you can see this actually. So this was the arm with the urine in and you can see at the moment they're just little faint red marks but that's where I've been bitten and there's only one on that side but probably about 50 or 60 there so I'm expecting that arm to swell up later today. It's possible that the smell, hormones or uric acid, a chemical found in urine, may actually have attracted the mozzies. I think I'll stick to my over-the-counter mosquito repellents and not, not urine, which I think my friends will be happy about when we're on holiday. So, myth busted, urine is not a mosquito repellent. Poor Amir. This is the Great British Urine Test. At our four pea pods, hundreds of people have provided samples to be expertly analysed by a team of scientists so that we can take a sneaky peek into the health of each city. Time to sniff out the smokers. While it may be decreasing in popularity, more than seven million people still smoke cigarettes. Do you smoke? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, which city smokes the most? From the people we tested across our four cities, it was Liverpool and Cardiff which had the highest amount of smokers, Glasgow smoking the least. In London, it's 44-year-old taxi driver Alex's first night out with his pollution monitor. I'm a lot more aware of the pollution now, and I can sense it, I can smell it in the cab, and it comes up in the readings. Sitting in traffic, you get high readings. They're always high. They're always high in the taxi because the vehicle I drive is, is a polluter. So look, I've just stopped on a rank now from work, I'm just gonna check the pollution levels on the monitor, as I expected, very high. It's like a death box, isn't it? You know, basically, you're sort of sitting here just breathing in crap, basically. Will Alex be able to make the changes needed to take him out of the danger zone? Five weeks ago, we met 19-year-old Shazni. Her original urine sample had one of the highest readings of alcohol we tested. Since then, there have been ups. I'm here and I'm drinking plain Coke, plain Coca-Cola. And downs. I'm not going to lie to you, had a few gins, went to the pub, played a bit of pool. Dr Christian would not be proud. Dr. Christian's not proud, but the question is, will she have done enough to improve the results of her urine test? Shazne. Hiya, hello. Nice to see you again. Welcome Hi, back. Good to see Hi, you. Shazne, nice Hi, nice to Hi. see you. Shazne, where are you? On uh, here. Yeah, at the front. That's you, right at the front. All right. I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't convinced that much had got through of what I said to you. OK. Is that fair? Um, I'd say so, maybe. So have you managed to make changes or was it hard? I have. It hasn't been like cutting everything out and, you know, but it's been cutting things down and sort of exploring a bit as well, which has been fun. Shazni says she's made changes, but a urine sample never lies. Five weeks ago, alcohol indicators in her urine were seven times higher than the rest of our hub samples. So let's have a look at you now. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that's wow, lower indeed. than I thought. Yes. yes. That's lower than I thought. Yeah. yeah. That's really impressive. But you said you enjoyed it and you actually seem to find it mm. quite easy. Yeah, exactly. So as you can see, it's not like right at the bottom. I haven't not drunk, but I've done it sort of on the weekends when I'm celebrating something or, you know, and it's not a sort of an every night thing. And what positive impact has that had on your life and your work? Yeah, I feel like in general, I just feel a bit more sort of not positive, but I just fit a bit more happy, I guess. Well, you've got off to a cracking start yeah. here with the alcohol, but there are some other things that we looked at as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the next thing, potatoes. Oh, no. Let's just have a little giggle at you before. This was oh, no. Miss Potato beforehand. <laughs> Let's have a look at you now. Hey, 
Yeah. That's good. It's really yeah. good. Have you consciously reduced your potato intake, or do you think it's just happened naturally? Um, I think a bit of both. And I, I have to say to you, I'm, you know, of almost everybody that we've seen, I thought you were going to be the hardest to convince to make those changes. I, I eat my words, you know, you, you've done fantastically <laughs> thank well. You. So I'm very happy. Yeah, me too. Well done. Fasni, thank you so much thank for coming you. in. I didn't know they'd be able to know what I'm eating and how much of the things I'm eating and drinking um, just from my urine. So I think that's pretty incredible. Coming up, can our pee really be used to generate electricity? We put these willing volunteer samples to the test. Oh. And we'll find out if Alex has reduced the signs of pollution in his pee. Welcome back to the Great British Urine Test. Bristol, Cardiff, Glasgow and Liverpool. A steady stream of people have been making good use of our pea pods. There's going to be kebab, um, Cornish pasties, hash, weed. I feel like you're going to have a lot of samples related to like party drugs from Glasgow, but I mean, you'll probably get worse than other parts of the UK, to be fair. Do you think there's many drugs in Cardiff? Um, there could be. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> With cannabis, the most widely used illegal drug in the UK, which city from our sample smoked the most? And the results are in. It was Bristol who has more cannabis smokers twice as many as Cardiff. For fruit and veg phobic Jimmy, this week has been a serious game changer. He was born on Thursday, so it's, it's been tough. Sleep is horrendous, but it's definitely changed the way I think about how I want to move forward with this and improve my life for him so I can run around with him and play with him and wrestle with him and teach him that Bournemouth are the best football team in the, the, the land and things like that. But will Jimmy's urine show some much needed changes when he returns to our hub? So far, we've proved that urine can reveal all sorts of secrets. But the power of pee doesn't stop there. A scientist from Bristol has found a way to convert our unwanted we into what he believes could be the renewable energy source of the future. Dr. Eropoulos's special converters contain microbes that feed on urine to produce energy. And sometimes people are interested and they want to hear more. Sometimes they, they just want to change the, time, the subject. So far, he's used pea power to charge mobile phones and even to light up the loos at Glastonbury. We want to find out what type of pea packs the most power. Who better to provide samples than the University of the West of England's women's football team? To make our experiment a little more interesting, our ladies have some competition. Does this group of six athletic, young, skillful women have more potential power in their pee than Molly, a New Forest pony? So far, Dr. Iropoulos's research has only used human urine. So could animal urine also help to provide energy for the future? Oh! A litre of urine collected from both parties. It's back to the lab to perform the tests. Dr. Iropoulos pours the first sample into a large container. Inside are the microbial fuel cells, which converts the Wii into electricity. This, in turn, registers on his voltmeter. It's stabilised now at 339 millivolts. Excellent. It's very good compared to ours. Now for sample number two. But it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't smell anything like human urine. 
So this is very intriguing. We're approaching the same level the human urine got to, yeah. and it's still climbing fairly rapidly. So, who has produced the highest reading? Looks like we have a winner. The winner is... Molly. Impressively, both samples generated enough energy to charge a mobile phone. Five weeks ago, Alex's urine flagged up dangerous indicators of air pollution, which can cause a host of health issues. Let's see where you are. Well. Since then, he's been closely monitoring his levels and trying to reduce exposure. But with driving a taxi in London, that might not be so easy. With a new sample tested, he's back at the hub to find out if his results have improved. Alex, hi. How you doing, Christian? It's nice to see you. I'm doing well. Hi, Alex. It's nice to see you. More to the point, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad at all. Now, one thing that we were really interested with with you was your exposure to pollution. And I know that was something that, that had worried you yeah. over, over time as well. Before the changes, this is where you were at. So really high. What changes have you made? I have, really? Do you know, I have tried to stay a little bit further back behind vehicles. Mm. And obviously the bigger vehicles, I try and keep out of the way of, because obviously they, they, it's more fumes. And those are manageable changes, things yeah. that you can sustain yeah. really while still doing your job. Let's see if they have made But well, you have one of the older style cabs as well, don't yeah, you? Which right. I personally quite like, those yeah. ones. But um, have you made any changes to that or not? No, yeah, so, so basically when I first got um, the monitor, the pollution monitor, <laughs> it was really high, like, seriously high and when you click the button it said like serious warning warning <laughs> like yeah. and and there was something wrong with the cab so i took it into the garage and they, they fixed it and as soon as they fixed it and i drove out it went straight down to low what did they fix so i don't know they like, cut a pipe so it might have been one that might be a little bit split and the fumes are coming through the cab yeah it's, it's an eye opener to think that you always think about everything around you never never the vehicle and yeah. i think this has taught me that it does matter what you drive. So let's see if those changes that we talked about have actually uh, affected your exposure to air pollution. Remember, your monitor is doing it on a sort of daily basis. Yeah, we're looking right. at it for what we're finding in a urine sample. Yeah. Uh, you know. So let's have a look at what you're doing now. Big Massive, difference. Yeah. Massive big change. Big difference. Huge change. I think also, obviously, as Amir said before, you know, maybe have the windows up and you're a bit more aware. So when I'm on the move, maybe I have the window open. But when I start seeing in traffic, I close the windows, turn the heater off. Just little changes make a massive difference. And absolutely proven yeah. there. The important thing is that your level of pollution exposure is trending down yeah. from the changes that you're making. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I've, I've needed to sort my life out for a little while, and this is sort of really, it's an eye-opener. Well, but are you going to sustain it? Yeah, of course I am, yeah. Fantastic. So I've got it for my kids, so oh. I want to be around as long as I can be, really. That's yeah, music so. to our ears, yeah, isn't it? That's a good it? answer, yeah. yeah. Alex, you've done really well, I think. Thank your, you very your, much. Your year and your results have proved that as well. So. Thank you very much for your time. My Thank pleasure. you very much. Well really done. appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you very much. Coming up, Jimmy and Michelle return to our hub to discover if our interventions have helped reverse their risks of developing chronic illnesses. Welcome back to the Great British Urine Test, where we're checking the nation's health one sample at a time. Returning to our hub after five weeks is new dad Jimmy. His extreme phobia of fruit and veg was putting his future health at serious risk. We take green veg intake as a starting point. Let's see where you sit. Yes. <laughs> it's lower than low, Jimmy, so, so we really need to have a think about yeah. this. After an emotional few weeks and the arrival of baby Robin, has Jimmy done enough to turn his health around? Jimmy, welcome back. Hi, nice Hi, to see Jimmy. you again. Nice How are you doing? You. Nice to see you. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you very much. So you've had a bit of time, I hope, to yeah. put into action some of the suggestions that we've made. How did it go? Hopefully I've made some sort of positive changes yeah. and... Uh, I, we'll I'm really interested in this, really, because when you came here last time, you had a complete aversion to vegetables and, and we sent you off to see that food psychologist. How was that? I actually spoke with a psychologist about 
smoothies and milkshakes and things like that. Um, all these weird combinations that I never knew that, you know, carrot and avocado, for example, mixed in with a bit of milk and honey. And I'd never have thought that that Listen was a thing. Listen to you. It's like a newborn know. baby. It is. What have we done? Yeah. What have we created? Yeah, so uh, I'm excited about trying those things as well. As Jimmy has only just introduced fruit and veg to his diet, and so far in small quantities, it won't be picked up in his urine. But we have got some interesting results from your urine. Shall we have a look at them? Yeah, you? I think let's have a look at probably the most important thing generally for overall health and weight, sugar intake. OK. When we first tested you, this was how much sugar you were taking in. Quite significantly more than the average. Yeah. And let's have a look at you now when we tested you. Wow. That's pretty damn good. It's really good. Isn't it? I really, really didn't expect that, honestly. Reducing your sugar in that dramatic way, your health and well-being will really benefit from those changes that you've made. Good. Do you think you'll be able to keep it up? Definitely. Mm. I'm really pleased. Yeah, and me you... too. I'm really, really pleased. No, I'm not as pleased well as done. me, I can tell you. No, thank Jimmy, you thank much. you for coming back in. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Jimmy. Nice to see you Cheers. again. Thank you. Back at our pea pods, the public are bursting to give us some samples. Scientists can now use our urine to tell just how healthy our diet is. In this sample, you'll find uh, apples, oranges, uh, I like potassium, uh, it's good for the system. I know that he's got a good diet, he, he eats very <laughs> it's gonna well. It's going to be full of nutrients. Yeah, eats all his greens. Glasgow, healthy city. We'll hope we're number one in the UK. We all know we should eat our five a day, but which of our cities has been eating the most? First up, leafy greens. From the samples we tested, it was Bristol that came out on top. Glasgow showing 10 times fewer markers. But what about fruit consumption? Cardiff is our winner this time with Glasgow redeeming itself by eating much more fruit than Bristol. Over the past five weeks, Michelle from Fife has been trying hard to change her lifestyle and reduce her risk of developing chronic illnesses such as type 2 diabetes. Now it's time to see if her results have improved. Hi. Nice to see you. Welcome back. Hello. Very nice to see you. Here it is. Your we. All right. What do you think this is going to show us this time round? So, um, <laughs> not one bit of bread or chocolate has passed my lips. I am just eating. Um, I'm very mindful of what I'm eating now. Um, so, lots of fruit, veg, um, lots of legumes. Yeah. <laughs> Good words. I learned that okay, one. I might be believing you more now in that case. <laughs> We are hearing your side of things. I think the proof is here, isn't it? I'm going to remain sceptical for now. <laughs> I can see I'm it. I'm going to remain sceptical for <laughs> okay. now. First up, legumes. Mm -hmm. This was you before. Shameful. So lower than low. Now let's see now whether your love of legumes has changed at all. So this is you in testing now. Look at that. Much yes, better. Much better. Much better. So not only do you know what they are, you're actually eating them yes. as well. So. Bonus. So what's next? Let's have a look. Aha. <laughs> now, Michelle. My nemesis. Your nemesis. When we first met, this is sort of how much chocolate you were getting through according to your urine sample. Oh, yeah. Quite mm. a lot. All right. But let's just see, has there been any real change or not? That's a real change. You know, that's a dramatic drop. Yeah. In. Do you still get the cravings now? No, I don't. It's not like I, I am not absolutely not starving myself. It doesn't even feel like I'm on a diet. I mean, I'm not on a diet. It's a complete lifestyle change. That's right. I'm just, I am selecting foods carefully. Gary, are you proud of her? Extremely, extremely proud. Yeah, um, I can see it being sustainable over the longer term as well. So this isn't, this isn't just for a, a short period. So this is something that it's a sort of lifestyle change, I think. Michelle, listen, lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Thank for you. I'm really, really well done. Michelle's lost 10 kilograms and showed a drop in BMI, moving her out of the morbidly obese category. Her biggest concern was that she may already have type 2 diabetes. But have we caught her early enough? Amir's got the results and is calling Michelle at home with the news. I have an ever shackled day. Yep. You ready? Yeah. Hello? 
Hi, Michelle. It's Amir. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Now, you said you've been terrified about the diabetes <sighs> test, and I, I think am. it's really important to talk about. Now, the good news, Michelle, is that you're not diabetic. That's the, the good news. <gasps> Oh my god! Oh, what a relief! Oh my god, that's brilliant! What it is is that we have caught it in the nick of time. Oh, thank Any God! Longer would have pushed you into that diabetic ring. This is the time to do something about it. Yes, I could hug you. I feel so happy right now. Like, ah! <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Thank You're you. amazing. Thank you. And I'll see you soon. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> yes! Oh, my God. <laughs> I am one lucky lady. Thanks to our urine tests, Michelle's been alerted early to her risk of type 2 diabetes. And like Michelle, we all need to take more responsibility for our health. As a GP, I see patients all the time once they've already developed a serious health condition. But actually, we owe it to ourselves to change all of that. Our bodies are fantastic at giving us early warning signs, but it's up to us to learn to listen and understand those signs, then make small preventative changes to improve our health. And you know what? It might just save your life.